Today we are going to begin uh, Milton's essay of education, uh, which is a short essay. Uh, even though we read it as, a, as an essay, uh, it is actually a letter written to uh, Samuel Hartley, one of the uh, English uh, reformers in education. Hartley was a disciple of the Polish, uh, sorry, uh, the Czech uh, reformer in education, uh, uh, who was called Comenius. I am writing in the chat box. Comenius and uh, Hartley uh, himself lived in Poland uh, for many years and it is probably there that he came under the influence of Comenius and uh, when he returned to England then he uh, brought with him uh, the influence of Comenius in the matter of uh, reform in education. <coughs> so uh, this essay is a letter addressed to Hartley as uh, you read the earlier essay, Aleopagitica, which was actually a speech or oration. So we uh, become familiar with two genres, uh, an oration and a letter, by reading these two essays. Uh, the essay is simply titled of education, uh, like uh, many of Bacon's essays. Uh, these are just the, uh, this is just the continuity of uh, the Latin uh, way of uh, you know, giving title to one's compositions, uh, which began with D, D E, which meant of in English. Uh, therefore, it pretty, pretty much uh, drew the boundary of the uh, topic of discussion at hand. In this case, it is education. And as you know that uh, education was a uh, a uh, very uh, popular uh, topic of discussion for all humanists and Milton may be uh, looked upon as the last humanist uh, who uh, obviously was interested in the same issues in which uh, humanists before him were interested. When uh, Milton wrote this letter uh, it was published in 1644. Uh, so, uh, it, it was a letter meant to be published. Uh, even though it was addressed to Samuel Hartley, it was not meant to be a private letter. It was meant to be a letter that would be published. Uh, the tradition which uh, many letter writers uh, also followed. Uh, and in our country, for example, we know that Rabindranath wrote many letters which were actually meant to be published. Uh, therefore, the writer is very much conscious at the beginning that he is going to write something which will be read by a great number of people. Uh, when uh, Milton wrote this letter, uh, he was educating uh, his two nephews, uh, John and uh, Philip, uh, sorry, Edward, <coughs> John and Edward Phillips. Uh, therefore, in this uh, letter, Milton proposes an academy or an educational institution uh, which will have uh, students ranging uh, between the ages of 12 and 20, uh, uh, an elite group of students uh, who will be given a training much of it we will see is classical, a training which will uh, make them ready for attending private and public offices, uh, both during peace and when at war. Uh, therefore, the purpose of education which Milton uh, unfolds here or uh, describes here uh, is very much uh, to be an administrator, uh, to rule the country. Therefore, this uh, education that Milton imagines here is not an education for the masses. It is an education for the elite uh, people. And uh, therefore, uh, we uh, can imagine that 
there is a lot of uh, classics, that is Greek, Latin, Hebrew uh, sketches to be read, uh, which are prescribed, uh, because uh, the humanists believe that the classics uh, presented the best examples of uh, how a gentleman should be educated, how a man who is supposed to be a magistrate or a ruler or an administrator should be educated. So this uh, comes down from the tradition of Cicero and other you know, uh, classical scholars who thought about education. And incidentally, Milton also uh, spoke on education or uh, represented his ideas of education in uh, books 11 and 12 of Paradise Lost. So at the beginning Raphael uh, teaches Adam uh, when Adam is innocent uh, before the fall. And uh, that is one kind of education. And later Michael uh, teaches Adam uh, after his fall. Uh, and therefore in Michael's uh, prescriptions, uh, one has to keep in mind man's sinful nature. So these two perspectives of education, uh, which through the speeches of two angels in Paradise Lost, Milton had uh, already discussed, that also has uh, similarity with what we did in this essay, particularly uh, Michael's teaching of Adam. And it has, also, it has been noted by many critics, and there are essays where critics discuss this part. Milton writes that he is writing on the question of reformation of education by being requested by Hartley. Now Hartley himself wrote a book uh, on this uh, subject, and uh, wanted uh, his book to be uh, read by uh, important English writers and authors uh, and also he wanted them to participate in a debate and discussion about reform of education and thus Milton comes into the picture. Uh, Hartley's purpose was to uh, suggest a new kind of uh, syllabus in the lines of uh, Comenius' prescription. Nevertheless, to write now the reforming of education, though it be one of the greatest and noblest designs that can be thought on, and for the one where of this nation perishes, I had not yet at this time been induced, but by your earnest entities and serious conjurements, as having my mind for the present half diverted in the pursuance of some other assertions, the knowledge and the use of which cannot but be a great furtherance both to the enlargement of truth and honest living with much more peace. So as in Arabic political, here also we find that the question of truth uh, remains paramount in Milton's mind, whether he is talking about censorship or he is talking about uh, reform of education. Nor should the laws of any private friendship have prevailed, me, have prevailed with me to divide thus, or transport my former thoughts, but that I see those aims, those actions, which have only with me the esteem of persons sent hither by some good providence from a far country to be the occasion and the incitement of great good to this land. So the far country is Poland, uh, where Hartley lived and from where he came to England. And as I hear you have obtained the same repute with men of most approved wisdom and some of highest authority amongst us, not to mention uh, the learned correspondence which you hold in foreign parts and the extraordinary pains and diligence which you have used in this matter both here and beyond the sea, either by the definite will of God's ruling or the peculiar sway of nature which also is God's work. So uh, for Milton the Puritan, 
nothing happens accidentally. Everything happens uh, by God's will. So the fact that Hartley had got a reputation uh, by having correspondence with a great number of foreign writers and that he came to England, all this uh, Milton looks upon as, uh, as uh, initiated by God. Neither can I think that so reputed, so valued as you are, you uh, to the forfeit of your own discerning ability, you impose upon me an unfit and over argument, but that the satisfaction which you profess to have received from those incidental discourses, which we have wandered into, hath uh, pressed and almost constrained you into a persuasion that what you require from me in this point, I neither ought nor can in conscience differ beyond this time, both of so much need at once and so much opportunity to try what God has determined. That is, uh, I cannot defer this uh, writing on education anymore. Uh, I will not resist, therefore, whatever it is either of divine or human obligement that you lay upon me, but will put it set down in writing as you request, as you request me, that voluntary idea uh, which had long in silence presented itself to me for a better education. Uh, by idea here, Milton means the ideal pattern, the pattern of education. A better education in extent and comprehension, uh, far more large and yet of time far shorter, and of attainment far more certain that had then had yet been in practice. So the education uh, described by Milton will be much more extensive in scope but can also be given in much short, much short, much shorter time. Uh, which we see that uh, Milton uh, educated uh, his nephews in Latin in a year. So they were able to learn in Latin uh, what people learn over uh, two, three years in school. They were able to learn that in one year. So Milton wants to shorten uh, the period of learning also. To tell you therefore what I have been benefited here in among all renowned authors, I shall spare. And to such what many modern journalists and didactics more than ever I shall be, uh, I have, have projected my inclination leads me now. Which means that I am not going to uh, give you a list of all the classical authors uh, who inspired me in writing. But uh, he uh, refers to the modern genres and didactics. Uh, these are books written by uh, Comenius. Jan Amos Comenius, the full name is Jan, which we pronounce as Ian, Ian Amos Comenius, a Czech reformer of education. And uh, Janua is a, a book, Janua Linguarum uh, Reservata by Comenius. You know, Reserata, I think that is it. Sorry. Reserata. And the other book is Didactic, Didactica. Uh, it is Didactica Magna. So, uh, Janua means threshold or doorstep uh, from the Roman god Janus uh, who looks both ways. So, threshold uh, to grammar or to language. That was one book which was uh, meant for young pupils and uh, Didactica Magna, the great didactic. Uh, so, these uh, were uh, pedagogic books that uh, uh, interested the humanists. So Milton uh, refers to these two books, which is that he read these two books. I suppose uh, the date 1657 of Didactica Magna uh, must be a later date, because a book uh, would be published uh, a number of times, it will have many editions. Uh, since Milton publishes his tract in 1644, uh, he cannot refer to the book published in 1657, 
uh, even though uh, Barbara Lewalski, the editor, uh, suggests so. So it must have been published earlier, before 1644, and Milton must have known about it. Uh, but if you can accept of these two observations which have flowered off and are as it were the burnishing of many studious and contemplative years altogether spent in the search of religious and civil knowledge and such as pleased him so well in the relating, I will give you them to dispose of. To dispose of, so I present you my essay. You dispose it of as you please, which says that you not only read it yourself, but you also distribute it to other uh, people, other learned men uh, who, are, uh, who would be curious to read it. So Milton says that it is the burnishing uh, of my previous knowledge in political, civil and religious matters, uh, which I have written down here. And then in the next paragraph, Milton gives the end of education that he has in mind. So in uh, logical terms, it is the final cause. What is the objective of do doing something? That is the final cause. The end then of learning is to repair the ruins of our first parents by regaining to know God aright, and out of that knowledge to love him, to imitate him, to be like him, as we may the nearest by possessing our souls of true virtue which being united to the heavenly grace of faith, makes up the highest perfection. So even though a small sentence, but it is loaded with many allusions, first we see the idea that man had perfect knowledge before the fall. After the fall of Adam and Eve, this knowledge was ruined, and then the purpose of education is to repair this ruined knowledge and bring it back to perfection once again. Uh, then we have uh, to the idea that out of this knowledge man should imitate God. Uh, this idea uh, is found in John, John's Gospel. Then. Uh, after being united to the heavenly grace of faith, it makes highest perfection. So the, uh, that virtue can be possessed through knowledge and then it helps one to be united with God and that leads to highest perfection. Uh, this idea is uh, uh, an allusion to uh, Peter. The, uh, in the Bible, book 2. Therefore, Milton's imagination of the end of knowledge, of the end of education, we may say is guided by religion. So the end of all human activities for a Puritan like Milton is to uh, bring him closer to God to bring him to the original state of perfection before the fall. <coughs> and uh, make him the source of all virtues. But because our understanding cannot in this body found itself but on sensible things, not arrive so clearly to the knowledge of God and things invisible, as by orderly pawning over the visible and inferior creature, the same method is necessary to be followed in all discrete teaching. So here we have an idea that education proceeds from the sensible to the intellectual and from the visible to the invisible. Because of all, man cannot perceive anything but with the help of the senses. So whatever can be sensed by our senses, and whatever we can see with our eyes, we can perceive only that as knowledge. But of course it leaves out a lot of things which are to be perceived intellectually, spiritually, and uh, these are invisible. Therefore, 
the purpose of education is to help one to acquire the skill of proceeding from this, from the visible to the invisible, from the sensible to the intellectual. This uh, idea is uh, not exactly medieval. Uh, neither this idea is the same as that of uh, Hobbes and Locke, uh, who were not very far from Milton, uh, who emphasized on uh, the uh, importance of the senses for perceiving any knowledge. But uh, this idea is uh, a reflection of the humanist tradition, uh, the Platonic tradition rather, which believes that ultimate truth the ultimate truth is invisible and intellectual. The truth of God is invisible and intellectual. As by orderly conning over the visible, conning means uh, diligent study. So if we diligently study what is visible, uh, then uh, we do not arrive so clearly to the knowledge of God and things invisible. That is, we uh, we arrive to knowledge more, uh, we arrive at knowledge better by studying the visible than by you know, pursuing the invisible. So this is a fault of our nature from Milton's point of view, uh, which is a result of the fall of Adam and Eve. And seeing every nation affords not experience and tradition enough for all kinds of learning, Therefore, we are chiefly taught the language of those people who have at any time been most industrious after wisdom. So here is an explanation why we should study the classical languages and classical literature because all nations could not pursue education or knowledge. So those nations which excelled in them, we study their languages and their so that Language is but the instrument conveying uh, to us things useful to be known and though a linguist should pride himself to have all the tongues that babble cleft the world into, yet if he have not studied the solid things in them as well as the words and lexicons, he were nothing so much to be esteemed a learned man as any yeoman or tradesman competently wise in his mother dialect only. Some observations on language. First, that language is an instrument that conveys knowledge to us. And uh, a linguist may learn many languages, the many languages into which human tongue was divided after the destruction of the Tower of Babel. So a linguist may learn many languages, but if he does not study the solid things, then he has no knowledge, which means that language in itself cannot bring knowledge. It is only a means, but one has ultimately to study the solid things. Uh, like a tradesman or a yeoman, um, they would, uh, would not be able to Tread well, unless they also know the uh, objects in which they trade. So merely knowing languages would not help one in trade. So in Milton's time, in trade and commerce also, uh, the knowledge of languages was important, as the English used to have trade and commerce with many nations. And among their neighborhood, they had trade and commerce with the Dutch, with the French, and so on. But merely knowing the language will not help even the traders. So they must also know the objects. So in this assertion, we see this, uh, uh, we say, uh, at the base of this, there is this Renaissance uh, notion, humanist uh, notion about the dichotomy between race and verba, that is, things and words. Inasmuch had uh, written this famous book, De Duplici Copia, Verum et Verbum, of the double copia of things and words. 
So there are infinite number of things in this world and therefore to have a full language there must be adequate number of words to represent those things. Therefore Yurash must imagine that language must have copia, must have fullness so that uh, it can represent all the things that are there in this world. And then Milton goes on to say how in the present system of education one spends many years in school, seven, eight years in school learning the classical languages uh, which according to Milton is a mistake uh, because the languages must be learned but they must be learned quickly. So uh, in the uh, most important years of growth when one is uh, able, a child is able to quickly grasp uh, all kinds of knowledge. Uh, those years should not be wasted only in learning languages uh, and, and neglecting other disciplines. The Milton wants to shorten the period of language learning and pack more and more disciplines of knowledge into the syllabus. <clears throat> so the mistake of scraping together to spend seven or eight years merely in scraping together so much miserable Latin and Greek as might be learned otherwise easily and delightfully in one year. So Milton had taught his nephews Latin and Greek in one year. Uh, and, and this reminds us that Milton wrote a book of, book of grammar for young children or uh, accidents commenced grammar. And that which casts our proficiency therein so much behind is our time lost partly in two of idle vacancies given both to schools and universities, partly in a preposterous ex exaction, forcing the empty wits of children to compose hymns, verses and orations, which at the acts of righteous judgment and the final work of a head, filled by long reading and observing, with elegant maxims and copious inventions. So another criticism of the present system of education that it compels students to write uh, exercises as writing of themes, uh, uh, verses and orations. Now a student should not be asked to write these things because only a person who has his mind filled with a lot of learning, after reading a lot of books, only such a person can write themes, verses, or uh, you know, uh, orations. Milton was a follower of the French uh, logician philosopher Peter Ramus, and uh, Ramus himself uh, had developed a curriculum uh, of teaching young pupils in his college, uh, College de France. Uh, he was the royal professor and uh, Milton, Milton's course, uh, Milton's theme of uh, education is to some extent similar, similar uh, to that of Ramos. Uh, Ramos divided the entire day uh, hour by hour uh, and how a student should follow a particular routine when he should learn which subject and so on. Uh, and uh, they must also introduce a lot of literature in learning. Students should learn language by reading literary works. So those were new inventions in the uh, 16th century. And Remus was also uh, in touch with Comenius, uh, though Remus was a much greater influence in uh, Europe. And Milton uses certain terms here like art and praxis, uh, which uh, makes it very clear that he is following the Remus scheme. Uh, because Remus divides uh, the world of knowledge into three Natura, so Natura is nature, that is the primary object of study, nature, the world of things must be studied. Arts means theory. So one must write and read and study and understand the theory of studying nature. Uh, that is the theoretical disciplines. 
praxis leaves practice. So uh, theories must be uh, supplemented with praxis, uh, which uh, Francis Bacon also emphasized uh, when he suggested that there should be uh, practical experimentations carried out in the laboratory uh, to supplement theoretical knowledge. So Milton also here uses these terms. Uh, these are not matters to be writing uh, from close titles like blood out of the nose or the plucking of untimely fruit. It is <laughs> making very young children write themes and orations is like plucking unripe fruits. Uh, besides the ill habit which they get of wretched barbarizing against the Latin and Greek idiom with their untutored anglicisms odious to be read, yet not to be avoided without a well-continued and judicious conversing among your authors digested. Who is this car's test? Barbarizing, that is, uh, students of schools in England uh, who were given Latin training, uh, they barbarized it, that is, uh, by anglicism. So when they spoke in Latin, there would be a lot of anglicism, that is, the influence of the English language on their Latin, which is a barbaric perversion of the classical language which Milton hated. We see some example of uh, students talking in Latin in uh, James Joyce's uh, portrait of the artist as a young man. They are the Irish students, they are talking in Latin, they are university students. Uh, so uh, the students do not learn Latin and Greek idiom, but they impose English idiom on Latin and Greek. Uh, which uh, distorts it. And so they must avoid it by having a judicious conversing among your authors. So here, uh, conversing suggests conversation, but actually uh, it here means associating with the classical authors. If they must have an association, that is, they must read. Uh, classical authors much more. And by association with the classical authors, their Greek and Latin will improve. This is precisely what Remus, Remus uh, suggested in his uh, teaching practice, that language should be learned by reading classical authors. So he would uh, uh, quote poems from Ovid or other you know, authors and poets in his grammar book. So Remus also wrote many grammar books and uh, books of logic and so on, elementary books for students, uh, which are full of quotations from classical poets and dramatists. And uh, why I am mentioning this? Because all this was a completely new approach towards learning uh, in the Renaissance because the traditional learning which was continued through the Middle Ages did not have any place for literature in it. But when uh, people like Ramos introduced literary pieces, poems or quotations from drama, Greek tragedy or so on, then learning such dry subjects like grammar and logic became much more interesting. So this was a contribution of the humanist. So Milton here does not refer to uh, whose poet should be read or whose author should be read right now, but he says that classical authors should be read. Uh, and pure authors digested with this scarce taste. That reminds you of uh, Bacon's uh, essay of studies, uh, where Bacon says some books are to be cured, some are to be uh, digested and so on. So the metaphor of eating, the alimentary metaphor, with this curse test, whereas if after some preparatory rounds of speech by then certain forms got into them, uh, got into memory, they were led to the praxis thereof uh, in some chosen short book, lesson thoroughly, uh, to, uh, lesson truly to them, they might then forthwith proceed to learn the substance of good. So the practice of reading some chosen short book, some book by some classical writer and uh, to learn the substance of good things and arts in due order 
which will bring the whole language quickly into their power. So you see that praxis comes first and then art. That is, after you have the practice of reading good classical writers, then you come to grammar, which is the theory, or rhetoric, you know, which are the theories of studying literary texts. So that is the due order, this word order, or the word method. Now they are very important uh, in uh, the education uh, prescribed by Peter Deva. Decided to be the most rational and most profitable way of learning languages and whereby we can best hope to give account to God of our means spent herein. So for every action one has to give account to God. So uh, Milton says that I think that this is the best way that languages can be taught to young children and I can give account to God that uh, I make them spend their time profitably. And for the usual method of teaching arts, you notice the word method, uh, which uh, refers to order. Uh, it is a term from logic. Uh, Ramus uh, wrote on method, uh, which was kind of uh, reformation of the uh, different confused methods that were uh, practiced beginning from Aristotle or based on the study of Aristotle. So, uh, in Lemma's method becomes much, much more uh, simple. Uh, it uh, makes use of memory. Method or order also means disposition. So, in classical rhetoric, uh, there are two parts, invention and disposition. Uh, invention means invention of the arguments and disposition means their ordering, marshalling. So, in Milton's essay, you will find these terms. And for the usual method of teaching arts, I deem it to be an old error of university not yet well recovered from the scholastic grossness of barbar age, barbarous ages that instead of beginning with arts most easy and those uh, he such as are most obvious to be sense, they present their young unmatriculated novices at first coming with the most intellective abstractions of logic and metaphysics. So, the uh, Milton comes to the question of theory, arts here means theory. He says that uh, following the scholastic system, that is the medieval system of education, many universities, uh, they are still steeped in this kind of an error that they teach students most abstract sciences like logic and metaphysics in their childhood, uh, which should be taught at a much more mature age. Uh, and uh, in childhood, students should be taught subjects which are easy, so that they having but newly left those grammatic flats and shallows where they stop unreasonably to learn a few words with lamentable construction and now on the sudden transported under another climate to be tossed and turmoiled with their uh, unballasted wits in fathomless and unquiet deeps of controversy. Controversy means disputation. So students were made to practice disputation, logical disputation. So Hamilton says that first the students labor in learning grammar for many years. They only learn certain words or certain terms because uh, uh, grammar is not taught through uh, literature, so they are given the theory of grammar, pure theory, and they find it very difficult. And then they are, they have to participate in logical disputation, and they are not used to this climate. They are suddenly thrown into as if in a new climate where they have to uh, learn logic and disputation. Uh, they would uh, do for the most part grow into hatred and contempt of learning, mocked and deluded all this while with ragged notions and babblements, while they expected worthy and delightful knowledge. In poverty or youthful years call them importunately their several ways, and hasten them with the sway of friends either to an ambitious and mercenary 
or ignorantly zeal as divinity. So this is how students in those days uh, who were not taught properly, how their careers ended. And this uh, uh, makes me think that today, even today, it is not much different. And our students, those who uh, struggle in the years of formation in schools, and then this, if some of them come to have uh, university education, then they feel themselves overwhelmed by the uh, education that they are supposed to have at the university level and ultimately they are influenced by their friends to seek some uh, vocation which is mercenary vocation which has nothing to do with uh, the humanities or literature or uh, in winter days they would become divinity that is uh, they would become priests by having uh, training, uh, becoming a uh, training for a few years uh, in the seminary and they will become, uh, obviously, they will become very bad priests because their entire system of education, their entire uh, career of education uh, had frustrated them. Uh, they could not learn anything properly, they could not digest anything properly. So they were taught theory earlier and practice later and uh, therefore they uh, had totally a misguided kind of education. And uh, thus in this paragraph we find uh, Milton criticizing uh, this uh, system of education which is a continuation of the medieval scholastic tradition. Some allure to the trade of law, grounding their purposes not only prudent and heavenly contemplation of justice and equity, which was never taught them. So lawyers are also mercenaries. They are not taught the most beautiful aspects of law, which is upholding of justice and equity or equality. Therefore, they practice law without understanding these notions, and because these were never taught them. But on the promising and pleasing thoughts of litigious terms, fact contentions, and flowing fees, uh, litigious term that is uh, periods when courts would be in session. In those days also courts had vacations. So the uh, budding lawyer, he would only think of the period when the court will be in session and uh, there will be many fact contentions, many cases and he will be able to extract money from his client. So here you see uh, criticism of the lawyers. Uh, who lack all noble uh, objectives for practicing law. Uh, but Milton is not blaming the lawyer, but he is blame, blaming the system of education which makes him such a mercenary lawyer. Others betake them to state affairs with souls so unprincipled in virtue and true generous breeding that flattery and courtships and tyrannous aphorisms appear to them the highest points of wisdom. Those who become uh, courtiers or those who find a job uh, in the court, so they become, uh, they are full of flattery because they do not have any uh, principle or they do not have inculcated the virtues of a noble education. Therefore, they become flatterers or shifty and uh, with even as aphorism, uh, Milton refers to the uh, practice of uh, use of aphorism, short, pithy summations of complex ideas. Milton applies the term in a derogatory sense, deriding those who use shallow maxims as guiding principles. In the 17th century there was a uh, trend of writing books of aphorisms or maxims. So Erasmus has a book uh, called Aphorisms. Uh, La Rochefoucauld in France wrote maxims. But these are the good books. 
but there were innumerable uh, petty writers writing books on aphorisms and maxims. So those were basically like today's, uh, you know, guidebooks uh, which are sold in local trades. Uh, supposing uh, to uh, gain, you know, a lot of wisdom. Uh, in other words, wisdom simplified into formulas, maxims, aphorisms, and uh, which was a way of uh, suggesting that there is a shortcut to knowledge. So if you can uh, remember a few aphorisms then, you are a knowledgeable person. So Milton uh, obviously is unhappy with uh, this kind of practice of writing aphorisms and maxims. Uh, both ships and tyrannous aphorisms appear to them the highest points of wisdom, instilling their barters, uh, their uh, barren hearts with a conscientious slavery, if as I rather think, if not be feigned. Uh, feigned here means pain, A P I G N E D. So their hearts become full of slavery because they merely follow those books of aphorisms. They cannot think on their own. Others, lastly, of a more delicious and airy spirit, retire themselves knowing no better uh, to the enjoyments of ease and luxury, living out their days in feast and jollity, which indeed is the wisest and the safest course of all these, unless they were with more integrity undertaken. Others, they simply retire and uh, indulge themselves in luxury. Therefore, these are the different errors, the different uh, you know, mistakes, uh, which uh, are products of a faulty system of education. And these are the errors and these are the fruits of uh, we spending our prime youth at the schools and universities as we do, even in learning mere words or such things cheaply as well better unlearned. So, this present system of education, it teaches us only words. It does not teach us any knowledge about solid things or substance. Or if it teaches anything, those things are better not learned, Newton says. So maybe he is referring to, uh, you know, dicing, gambling or other kinds of uh, practices. Uh, which are better not learned, but which uh, would be the practice of many students in uh, English universities at that time. So I'll stop here. If you have any questions, you can ask me.